repeatedly over and over again. That's adorable. Yeah. Oh, it looks like we're live. Okay. That's awesome, Imran. Yeah, congrats to him. Yeah. Thank you. Is he going to play college ball? I think we're live, but. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Hopefully, he has some, some gains in the next year. All right. Cool. Well, I think we're live. Thank you, Katie, for troubleshooting that. Um, so welcome everyone to Our Path Forward with CARE Washington. Uh, this week, we are talking about work from home and uh, boundary setting. Oh, is there a go? Whoops, sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah, so we're talking about working from home and boundary setting and just all that good stuff. And today we're joined by uh, Dr. Noor Asala and uh, Imran Siddiqui, our executive director. And yes, welcome both of you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks once again for hosting. Yeah. Very excited to have this conversation. It's something we've been talking a lot about just at work and what reimagining the workplace looks like. So I'm gonna bring up our little description here of the show so I can share that with everyone. Let me close my chat box. Here we go. Yeah, so today's show title, this is I think the fourth episode we've done for Our Path Forward. And today we're talking about thriving in a work from home environment with Dr. Noor. And just wanna read a, a one-liner about what Our Path Forward is about. Um, so Our Path Forward is a weekly Facebook live show by Care Washington that gives viewers a behind the scenes look at the work that we do and invites them to join us in reimagining our path forward in this post-Trump, post-COVID, inshallah, era. So yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right into the topic. I'll pull up my questions here. So Noor, I wanted to start with you. Let me make my screen bigger so I can see you here. I wanted to start with you. Um, can you take us back to March, 2020, when this all started and we started hearing about this virus called COVID-19? You are our Senior Programs and Operations Manager at CARE Washington and you're kind of our de facto HR person, even though that's not technically your title. Uh, what was it like for you during that time trying to navigate all of this uncertainty and what was going through your head at the time? Yeah, um, it was not fun. I don't think it was fun for everyone, anyone. Um, it was early March. I remember we were all taking our laptops home with us every day because we weren't sure when it would happen, what would happen, how long we'd be away for. And so that was almost the extent of our foresight, you know, and on March 5th, I remember that was the day uh, we decided we weren't going to come back. But, you know, it's cute to think about now, but our fridge was stocked, like we had left all our plants and we really kind of had no, no way of knowing how long or how almost permanent it was going to be. Right. Um, and so it was just absolute like confusion. And I think the scariest part, you know, we were thinking about work, but we were also just worried on a very basic level. Like I was worried about like food supply chains being cut off and, and just crazy things like that. You know, we had, we had no time to build any sustainable like work from home habits or anything like that. And nobody had any answers. And I yeah. think that was the most terrifying part. Um, and I mean, now, you know, when I think back on it, I don't know about you guys, but I have a really hard time like conjuring up memories of what like the day to day was even like, like I wasn't even forming memories. It was so chaotic. It's funny, I totally forgot about the, like the stocking of food and groceries and like toilet paper, the run on toilet. I haven't even thought about that. I totally forgot about that until you just brought it up. And that was a big thing. And hand sanitizer, you couldn't find hand sanitizer anywhere. There was that young guy who got in big trouble for, he bought a whole bunch of hand sanitizer and then like jacked up the price and like mm -hmm. just trying to let people in. That was crazy. I had my family sending me toilet paper in the mail because we couldn't, Robel and I waited and we oh. couldn't find any toilet paper. Yeah, we were like sharing our hand sanitizer with yeah. like friends and neighbors. It was crazy. Yeah, gosh, man, crazy times. Um, 
Imran, I know you were, so you weren't with us during when the COVID outbreak first happened. I think you've been with us for about half of the year that we've been working from home. And I kind of wanted to get your perspective since you were an outsider, like watching from afar when this first happened, but now you're an insider. You've been with us for since last summer. Um, so I know you were kind of watching the work that we do in Washington Care Washington. What did, what did it look like from the outside? Like, you know, it probably felt like chaos, especially in the beginning for us on the inside. And I know you all were going through the same transition too, of course, in CARE Arizona, but what, what did you observe from the outside, like watching CARE Washington during this transition? How did it look? Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely, you know, something as, as somebody was working, you know, in an organization that was that does the same thing, you know, a, a fellow chapter out there in Arizona. I think a lot of times people sort of lose sight of like what, what it takes to like make an organization run. Like, you know, it, it's, it's a day-to-day -day grind, um, you know, like care Washington's always done a great job of, of getting out there and punching above their weight and like, you know, getting out there and producing these wins for, for the community. But, you know, we have to look at, you know, what it was like just as an organization to experience this up close. Like this was the epicenter of where things were, were hitting for the first time. Um, for us in Arizona, it was like this cloud that was like slowly shifting in our direction. And it was, it was definitely like, we saw it coming, but we didn't, like Noor said, we didn't have any idea of how long this process was going to, was going to last, was going to be a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you know, now it's been over, over a year, but you all were in, in the midst of, of that. And just to see how, how it was handled, like, because a lot of times, like when people see like an organization, they see sort of the community facing folks that are out there on the front lines who are doing the interviews or showing up at the press conferences. But the way that CARE Washington, like just sprung into action, like right as this was hitting, as Noor said, it was chaotic and like it, like you weren't generating memories during that time. It was you know, probably very traumatic on a day-to-day -day basis, but you would not have been as successful if you didn't have a team that was like, co you know, cohesive in that way, like coming together during that time. Like this was the front end of the pandemic where the first major blow up of, of cases were, were in the United States. And like, you have to take that into account. Like, how are we going to serve the community? Like the calls for help did not stop coming in during that time. Like you still had people like Jim, like taking the cases on the front lines and answering those phone calls. And you have to figure out like, how do we get resources to our community out here? And so just seeing how you all like Masi and, you know, the rest of the team were responding to this and you were actually like being on the front lines of what was happening out here in Washington state, that was really admirable just as an outsider perspective. But then I know like from sort of somebody who's working parallel to this, like you can't be that successful unless you actually have like a really good functioning organization mm -hmm. that's wor working internally. So the fact that, you know, our communications were on point, you know, our programming was on point and everything was happening. It's just a signal to me as, as somebody who was looking at what you were doing is it was really um, an amazing effort. And then you're planning like you know, you have to immediately jump into Ramadan. Like this is the major fundraising, fundraising time of the year for any Muslim organization. And you all had to deal with like being in the epicenter during like your number one fundraising time. And yet we look back a year later and you not only went into this, like, you know, united, but you came out of this whole situation um, stronger. So just admirable to see like how everybody was working. Mm -hmm. As you're talking, I'm like, the memories are coming back and I'm starting to remember like that time and just it's like COVID once we once we started to realize like as a country what a big deal COVID was and how serious this was um everyone was kind of scrambling and it's like we wanted people to know we, first we were thinking like what what is our purpose right now for our community like what can you know, our purpose is always to do the work we're doing and to be here and continue doing that work. But with this new virus and this pandemic, like what else can we be doing? What role can we be playing or should we be playing right now during this pandemic for our community? And it was, 
it's a very interesting time. Like Messi, you know, maybe he's watching. Hey, Messi, if you are, um, he really sprung into action. Like there was no delay. It was like, all right, this this thing is hap- happening. COVID. What does our community need to know? How can we function as a hub, as a resource hub? How can we connect our community to the different resources out there? We did a lot of like informational webinars on resources for housing, you know, paying your mortgage help, rent help for renters, um, the PP, the payroll, protection payroll, I can't remember, but. PPP, yeah. PPP, yeah. Um, Help for small businesses and nonprofits to get funding during this time. So it was a crazy time and a lot of people got hit really hard by it. Um, a lot of nonprofits, you know, we got hit by it, but thank God, like we have come out, we've, we've survived and not only survived, but we actually in a lot of ways thrived, I think. And I think in some ways, you know how they talk about in how, when you have a relationship with someone and you go through something together, like some big event or like traumatic life event or some, something you bond. So I think in some ways it's like, I was thinking about, even though I really miss my teammates and like being in the office and seeing people and we're distant from each other. So it's been hard that way. I think in some ways, like going through this together and kind of like this emergency, like we rallied the team and in some ways it brought us closer together, I think so. We had to be vulnerable. I mean, there was no hiding your, you know, your pets or your baby or your (laughs) whatever. So we got to know, we brought our whole selves into these Zoom meetings. Whereas when you go to work, sometimes you leave certain parts of you behind. Absolutely. So we really got to know each other really fast. Also because we were just stressed out. I was pregnant drinking pickle juice on a Zoom call (laughs) and I forgot. And then you started like laughing. I was like, oh, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, Imran, we're gonna talk with Noor here in a second about how Care Washington specifically like navigated this whole work from home transition. But I'm wondering if you can give us an overview of how our team and organization have been functioning during this time and how we've adapted. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, that's one of the things that actually attracted me to actually come out here to uh, Care Washington was just, you know, dealing with the team and like seeing everybody is like so driven to do their work and they, everybody has a function within the organization and they, they really like have a strong, like level of team cohesiveness and vibe with each other. So, um, and that's something that's amazing. So on a day-to-day basis, you know, where we're constantly in touch with one another, we're, we're trying, you know, organizing across different lines. We have different work groups within, within the organization. You know, we have a legal team, we have a programs and operations team, we have a communications and now data team as well. So we're constantly like, you know, being creative and trying to, to work with one another across these different lines, but it's like always productive. It's always, you know, there's always a positive output and everybody really vibes well with one another. It's people who come from a really diverse, uh, you know, background, you know, folks from different walks of life who are uh, bringing their skill set to the table. So that's just one of the more amazing things about about this team. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Nor, I want to get into some of the specific challenges that we've navigated over the last year and how we've created policies and best practices to address those challenges. Could you talk about some of the issues that arose or became clear during our transition into working from home as an organization. And can you talk about how the team at Care Washington has tried to tackle those? Yeah, so once once those first few weeks passed and the chaos kind of not subsided, but you know, we were still reeling in some ways, but people are resilient and people want to get back to their routines. And we were really starting to miss each other, miss, miss the times you know, we were still doing work. So the work and the meetings were still happening, but all of that between time, like that hallway time, checking in with each other, all of that hadn't been happening. And so that was one of the first adjustments we made was to meet that desire for social time. Was as you guys know, we started our game hour, um, which is every other week. And it's not 
mandatory last thing we wanted was like another obligation for folks um, when there was already so much going on. Um, so it was just a simple trivia game where, you know, we could be together as a team and just have fun. We've moved on. Now I think we play code names a little more often. Um, and so it's just a time to be together, spend time together. Um, I would say that's one of the first things we did. And then um, more recently, I think this is the most recent big change we've made is um, we've had countless Zoom meetings. And as our team has grown and as our programming and everything we do has, has grown, we've had more meetings. Um, and one thing we never did was we just kind of let the meetings happen. We never sort of said what was okay and not okay to do in those meetings. And I think without intending to, by not saying anything, we had put around strict boundaries around what was okay and not okay at meetings. And so we went ahead and said, you know, you can, if you're exhausted, have your camera off for the whole meeting. You can, if you're hungry, have a snack during the meeting. Um, if you are feeling like you want to say something, but you can't, you know, you don't know quite how to get a word in edgewise, use the chat box. All of these things are available mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. you. All of these things are fine. And that was the case all along. Um, but the, you know, the things that the fact that they were okay needed to be said out loud, yeah. couldn't just be assumed. And I right. think that's a theme with just any policy we, we pull out is just, you have to let people know what is okay. And they mm -hmm. will, you know, give people the tools to enforce their own boundaries. Right. And something to reference, like what, what mm -hmm. is, you know, and I think, and we're going to get into talking about like boundaries and like mm -hmm. power and privilege and sometimes when you're maybe you've been at the organization longer or you have like more seniority you you're like yeah I'm gonna eat on camera or you just you know you have that power whereas like you hire a new staff member or maybe an intern and like they don't maybe know that so it's it's important as yeah, an organization okay. yeah yeah um I know you have some great tips for transitioning organizations that are transitioning to work from home, setting healthy boundaries and all that stuff. So we're going to have Katie uh, paste those tips in the comments section. And we're also going to share them on our other social platforms. So be on the lookout for those. There's some really good information. Uh, I want to talk about boundaries now because boundaries, as we all know, are really key to having healthy relationships, whether it's with our family or friends and even our coworkers, right? And at our workplace. And they're really key for having a healthy work-life balance. I know Noor and I think Imran too, we all listened to that KUOW interview with Microsoft's lead scientist. Was it Jamie Teben? It was a woman, yes? I think so, yeah. Okay, I thought so. Um, and we were both struck by this really profound quote that she had uh, about the role that space played in the workplace before we moved to working from home. And she was talking about setting boundaries and how space as a boundary, that's no longer the case for us. So I wanna read that quote and then we'll talk a little bit about it. She said, we were using physical space as a technology to create boundaries in our life. Space delineated when we started work in the morning and when we left work in the evening because we were changing our location. And so what struck me about that was like, it's so funny how you never think of something as like a tool or technology until you don't have it. So here we had this, we had space and it served a, a really important purpose, which was creating this boundary between work and home. I never thought about that before until it was taken away. And suddenly I'm working from home slash living at work. <laughs> so yeah, it just really struck me as well, Nora, and, and I know you said that that really stuck out to you as well. Can you talk about the loss of physical space and the impact that it's had for us as an organization? Yeah, and it was, you know, the more I think about it, the more I can just think of just how many ways. Like, I feel like if space was like this fence around work and it got mm -hmm. ta taken away and now work is just everywhere. Um, <laughs> and that, that works too for, you know, physical boundaries, you know, at the, um, Imran, you've seen our office too. Yeah, our, our offices are pretty small. So we couldn't have everybody in every single meeting. So right. some people were afforded 
space and boundaries through that restriction of that physical boundary. We couldn't invite everybody to every single meeting. Um, and then there was, you know, the boundary, this is important too, between a work day and a vacation day. Now that you're in the same space, you're at home, what's yeah. to stop you if somebody requests a meeting from saying, yeah, I'll do it, you know, when you're on your vacation day. Um, and that's, that's a really hard one. That's probably one of the toughest ones, I think. And then um, just having space as a natural place where you can have a check-in with somebody, you know, a lot of times with managers and staffers, we can say, hey, how's it going this week? And we can tell by the stress on their faces, like, right. how are we doing? Do we need a check-in? Are things getting bad? Um, should, does, should I assign something? Should I do the exact opposite? Um, and all that is to say, you know, when all of that got taken away, I think, you know, specifically for the last one, one major thing is managers need to really be intentional about checking in with people. And I think, I think we've been really good about doing that at Care Washington. I don't think any manager in the, and a respective team does not have a standing weekly check-in, um, mm -hmm. whereas before you might've been able to get away with sort of a less frequent check-in. Um, and then to deal with, you know, that no vacation time, you know, we're mm -hmm. all, we're all just home. You have your vacation days, but folks aren't using them. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we did that I, I think we're, I'm really proud of is the COVID mental health days we've instituted that, you know, they expire if you don't take them. It's a day for, for somebody to use for whatever. Early on, I think it was with the intention of, you know, allowing people to go to the grocery store during off hours, That's right. do the PPE, go to the store, come back, deal with the PPE, like sanitize all the bags and all of that. Um, but it's, it's, still, it's still in place because we're still working from home and we still need to, that little bit extra to encourage people yeah. to actually take the time. And it just makes you feel valued. It's funny because I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I forget my mental health day every month. And so I appreciate you, Nor, you're always like reaching out to me like, hey, Jess, you haven't taken your mental health day. I'm like, oh, great. I forgot I have this. Like, I'm going to take Friday off. Cool. But um, yeah, super, super important stuff. Um, I think one of the things that I miss most about not being in the office are these casual interactions that we used to be able to have just like in passing. And I think Microsoft's lead scientist, she called it, she talked about spontaneously collaborating. To me, that has been one of the hardest things to recreate in this digital space. Um, and it's something I actually think a lot about. This is a question for both of you and, and maybe none of us have an answer to it, but do you think that we've totally lost that as an organization, that uh, that opportunity and ability to like have these casual interactions, have spontaneous collaboration, and do you do you see us being able to recreate those opportunities for spontaneity in this new work from home world, or perhaps something different? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there's there's a loss that that exists, like especially in this work, like the nature of this work, where we're having to deal with like such serious subject matter on a day-to-day -day basis, like what, when it's dealing with, you know, discrimination or hate crimes, you know, legal issues, like it is something that we need that sort of constant feedback and sort of this energy that uh, the team thrives off of and to be there to, to help out and to communicate with one another. So it's, it's difficult to be separate during this time, but also I think Thankfully, like this, this time is, is temporary. So it's not something that, um, you know, it's been a year. Yes. But at the same time, we now, I think being absent for that time frame, you start to appreciate what you actually had during those times. You realize what you lost. You may have taken that facet for granted in previous years that this is just normal way that things work. But now that you have had to sacrifice this, and you know go back like those relationships those mm -hmm. interac interactions that you're gonna have once you get back like those are things that we should savor more like you know even yeah. like internally like maybe the little um and this happens in any work environment um i'm not saying it happens at care washington but it's a natural human nature is that there's going to be uh you know little like petty conflicts here and there that exist no. um, in any space. And yeah, it d doesn't happen where we're yeah. utopia, but, um, but then like, I mean, you realize that these interactions between you and your coworkers are going to, are something that 
you know, you can, you can value a little bit more. So maybe it'll give you a little bit more of a, of a leeway to give people once you get back into that in-person in thing. Um, we all have, have, you know, difficulty, but I think just being appreciative of all the blessings that we've had prior to this and sort of mm -hmm. getting back to that will be something to put those things in perspective. I actually want to comment on something you said really quick because it made me think of something. They did KOW or NPR, they did a story on, you know, we tend to think of like our really big important relationships as adding the value to our lives, like our mom or our dad or our spouse or our kids. But they said really what research shows is that all relationships matter. So these little, I can't remember what they call them, but like these little small day-to-day -day interactions you have like with the person at the grocery store or your, the mailman or, you know, the doorman Gil at, at our office who I, I miss, <laughs> like I talk with him on Facebook um, and your coworkers, like those are real relationships that add a lot of value to our lives. They were talking about people who like maybe don't have family or aren't married and that how much those relationships add value to our lives. So that just made me think of that with what you were saying, Imran, but yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, we're going to have to also, I think there's going to be a period of readjusting to like, especially in the aftermath of dealing with a pandemic, like when you're walking down the sidewalk now, like it's a natural phenomenon for the person who's walking in the other direction to sort of step aside or take a different path. And like, we've been trained to sort of become like social yeah. distant during this time. So as we get back, like these little interactions in the hallway and the elevator, like how are we going to return back to that normal, that normal uh, situation? Or is it ever going to be normal? As I know. I think about that too. Nor, yeah. what do you think about the spontaneous collaborations and like these casual interactions? I think, I think it has become, you know, the spontaneous collaboration specifically, it has become mm -hmm. a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not when every meeting is pre-planned, right. um, it's, it's hard to just kind of, you know, just, just get in that flow and just like work together like that. Um, I do think, you know, as far as you know, the future of working from home and the hybrid models and all that, I think that is one of the main like work-based reasons why um, being in an office space is useful yeah. um, and needs to come back in some capacity. And then I think the main reason why being back in the office, at least for some of the time is important in some capacity is because of those small social interactions, just as you mentioned, Jess, it's just, yeah. it's, yeah, there is just no replacement for that. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's been so many different like tools and tech things that have been produced to like try to replicate it, but there's just nothing. I will say for spontaneous collaboration, the closest that we've come to it in this remote work from home space is by creating like designated WhatsApp groups. So we have a WhatsApp group called Current Events, which is where we can share anything, basically anything that's like not directly work related, like it's not a work item or a task. So it could be something in the news or, you know, this cute dog that we saw out on our walk or like anything that we want to share with the team. Um, and it's also an opportunity to be like, Hey guys, I saw this cool thing. You know, we should do this. Or what do you think about this? So like we've used WhatsApp for that and it's, it's worked as well as it can, but it's, it's definitely not the same as like being in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to think about. Um, Nor, I want to talk about, this is a big topic, but you've talked a lot about people's predispositions and preferences and how, while uh, those may have worked from them in a more traditional office space, they haven't served them as well in this new digital frontier. To be more specific, I'm thinking about how there have been challenges with communication, uh, setting boundaries like the ability to say no, um, and maintaining a healthy work-life balance. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, but we know that some people have more experience and more power and privilege when it comes to these things. And that can be based on things like seniority, in income level, what is your family situation like, your home environment, um race gender all mm -hmm. that stuff so I don't really have like a specific question I just want to hear your thoughts on that yeah yeah I mean so when the 
when the one boundary we had, that was our default boundary, which is space was removed um, and everybody went into their homes and onto their computers, uh, everybody was left to their own kind of predispositions or ability to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, I mean, just from, we've had this conversation before, just saying no is a lot harder just for women based on how they've been conditioned. Um, saying no in the workspace is a lot harder for newer employees who are of course trying to climb up the ranks than it is for like, you know, a boss, it would be much easier. And maybe, you know, um, somebody younger who's also similarly trying to network, trying to make a good impression and all of that stuff would have a much harder time saying no. And so we can't just sort of approach it ad hoc with like a blanket thing of like, you should feel comfortable saying no, you should always feel if you have too much on your plate, you can put it away. Like that's not realistic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about equalizing the access to saying no. Mm -hmm. um, and the key to that is just communication. I think it's it should be on managers as much as possible to just A, you know, make it okay to say no, communicate so that there isn't and a window where, where folks can say no or say, I need this or I need more time or I'm feeling super overwhelmed right now. Um, and then almost more importantly, I think managers need to model like good behavior of saying no and having healthy boundaries themselves. Yeah. So if there's, if somebody's manager, for example, is taking like zero vacation days, um, how is how is that team member supposed to feel okay requesting mm -hmm. or taking what is theirs, you know, mm -hmm. their vacation days? Um, so it's just about being really, really mindful with all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think just as you said, Jess, you know, it's um, married couples or, or married employees, um, mm -hmm. bosses, uh, people who've been at their jobs for longer, those people yeah. are all thriving in work from home situations. Yeah. And then it's uh, Gen Z single people, understandably, um, were alone during the pandemic, um, and people who are newer at their jobs who are having a really tough time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I always think about power dynamics in general when it comes to like mm -hmm. all things related to social relationships and whatnot. But it's I always think it's the the burden with something like this, the burden to like set the tone and like set the rules and like yeah. it's on the people with power, which are higher position people, whether that's EDs or directors or managers. And then of course, we're, we're, we are all individually responsible then to, you know, speak up for ourselves and that kind of stuff. But, but it really is like you're saying, it's on the managers and the directors to like clearly set those expectations mm -hmm. and standards, check in with their staff, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I was younger, I had like older women that I worked with take me under their wing and coach me on like how to ask for a raise, how to advocate for myself. And it was, it still is hard for me, but it was really hard when I was in my early twenties and I just started working in a professional work environment. So super important mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm glad that we have been really intentional about it at Care Washington and making it part of our work culture. And I'm just so happy that you've, you've done this work and like you've actually articulated it like we we've we've written down kind of these rules and policies and people can reference those and they're fluid they're flexible like yeah. we'll continue adapting and fine-tuning them as as we need and as our needs change as an organization but exactly. it's important because it protects everyone yeah and it makes for a better work environment yeah and it, it changes like you said based on right. feedback but yeah right. I feel like the answer to almost every question about this topic is always just like communication yeah. and making making it open and okay to communicate yeah. in those ways. Yeah. yeah, so important, so important. Um, for people who are just joining us, perhaps, I wanted to just reintroduce both of you and I, I forgot, I don't know if I said your title. So uh, this is Our Path Forward with Care Washington. It's a weekly Facebook Live show that we do where we have conversations with our team members and audience viewers about the work that we're doing at Care Washington. And we're also inviting people watching. It's kind of like a behind the scenes look at what we do at Care Washington. It's a chance for you to get to know some of our staff and for us to have conversations about what our path forward looks like in a post-Trump, um, soon to be, inshallah, post-COVID era. 
And today we're speaking with Dr. Noor, our Senior Programs and Operations Manager, and Imran Siddiqui, our Executive Director. And we're talking about working from home and uh, not just working from home, but what the future of work looks like and what we've done at CARE Washington to adjust to this new, this new world that we're living in. Um, this is a question for both of you. One thing I'm really excited about is that we now have this opportunity to reimagine the workplace. And one of the shifts that I've noticed as a new mom is that there seems to be a lot more recognition and acceptance that people are real people and they have real lives. And there seems to be growing support for things like flex hours, paid paternity, maternity leave, at office childcare. Um, it just seems like it's, and part of this too is that we live in a progressive area and a progressive state, but it just seems like the old way of thinking about work and the office specifically is changing and that it's becoming more based in like reality and people's needs. Uh, this is a question for both of you, but what excites you most about this new work from home frontier? And what is one way you think we can reimagine the status quo? It's kind of a big open. I can jump in there. I'll take a little bit of a step back just to like frame the situation for people because, mm -hmm. you know, like if you really look at, you know, care, for example, just historically, I think the community is sort of viewed care as like these sort of superheroes that spring into action uh, whenever there's an issue. Like you go back 25, 26 years, whenever there was, you know, an issue if a mosque got vandalized or firebombed or whatever it is, you'd see like care show up with, you know, always there springing into action, the sort of built up that level of of you know respect and ex expectation that we're just going to be here where these you know larger than life figures that are going to be uh here to jump into action for the community so that's awesome that is you know a great reputation to have and i think a lot of the folks that initially jumped into this work like there's folks even myself like i was somebody who had a job who had um, you know, who, who did this out of a passion of, of serving my community initially. I was a volunteer for probably mm -hmm. the first six, five years that I was doing this. So, you know, um, but like in reality, we have to look at people as our greatest resource. Like if you talk about sustainability, what does a, an organization like a Care Washington consists of, it consists of people. So you have to make sure that this resource, the people within your organization are sustainable, that they're, um, that they're renewed, that they feel um, actualized by the work. Like you can do this work um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but in our industry, there's like so much of a propensity to get burned out. Yes. There, like people are constantly, um, you know, they're, they're going full bore every single day dealing with, think about like one attorney who works for like all of the Washington state, you know, Muslim community or the Arizona Muslim community or, you know, um, Oregon or wherever it may be, like you're taking state cases from all over the place just to, um, you know, as one person, you have like some support staff and so on and so forth at the very maximum, but it burns you out like very, very quickly. Um, somebody who's getting media requests from all over the place, somebody who's get taking phone calls, you know, dealing with some really traumatic information. Um, that all is, is, is a byproduct of the industry that we work in. So there's a large propensity for folks who do this to do this for a short period of time. Right. They don't have a support system there. They get burnt out. And then they end up leaving um, the, the organizations and they sort of find a space that is more um, nurturing to their needs as a human being. Um, and so right. I think we as a Muslim community who, you know, care Washington is, is a resource of the Muslim community. We have to look at our organizations as, in a different way. Like we can't expect folks to be just like superheroes. We need like a support system that's in place um, a sustainable organization that's going to be there for the long, long haul. So having folks that are internal, that are, 
you know, they have the support, they have those, you know, flex days, you know, when they need it, they have, you know, maternity leave, like Jess was able to go out there on maternity leave and like, you know, come back and she's, you know, we're trying to support her as much as possible. And we're, inshallah, we'll, we'll be doing that pretty soon as well. So making sure that we, as Muslim organizations are taking care of our resources, the same way we would take care of our, um, you know, better than we're taking care of like our, you know, houses of worship, obviously, and like these other resources we have as an organization. So think about the people as our number one resource. Um, and I think that's just part of the evolution that exists when we have these conversations. We are like a true nonprofit organization. So we have to hold ourselves to the highest standards that exist within this industry. We want to be, you know, as, as, you know, structurally sound as a hundred year old organization like an ACLU or an NAACP or whatever it may be. So it's going to take making those steps, creating an environment that is nurturing for our, our employees. The work is actualizing. Like I mentioned earlier in this, in this talk, you see what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we're out there, you know, we punch way above our weight. We're doing this, this amazing work. Like when it comes to taking these legal cases or doing the media work or youth development and things like that. So we're doing this amazing legitimate work, but how do we make sure that it's sustainable yeah. for the long run is the true question. So I think this time has been a, a true test um, for organizations like us because we've proven that we can be even more productive mm -hmm. during a virtual, virtual work environment where people have that space where they don't have to be on camera we're not, I'm not doing like a wardrobe or shoe check for uh, our employees at our staff meetings or anything like that. So <laughs> we can be productive, but still foster a work environment that's collaborative, that gives people space and allows them to like really be here for the long haul. Yeah, I think actually those two things we, you know, and maybe this is like commentary on capitalism, but you do, you kind of view those two things at odds with each other. Like, oh, if you give people an inch, they'll take a mile. That's not the case. What we're seeing happen during COVID is just, I think, proof of that is that, no, when you give people space and you, yeah, you treat them like human beings and you allow them like certain freedoms, they will work har harder and they care about the work and you will actually be not only just as productive, but you'll be healthier. I think that's the word that I would use. Healthier as an organization. People aren't getting, you know, hopefully people aren't getting burnt out. You're not making people feel used. And guess that, that, that guess what? That helps with like staff retention. That helps with recruitment. You know, if you're able to keep someone on for five, 10 years versus trying to hire someone every year because they're just overloaded, you know? And, and it also is like a issue of accessibility too. Like who, who gets to do this kind of work if it's, you know, maybe if you're young and single and it's your first job, you can work 60, 70 hours a week. And, um, but for people maybe that are older, trying to start families or that kind of stuff, you'll, you'll lose those people. So things like maternity, paternity care. Um, of course, we have that now as a state, which is amazing, but it's very, very important stuff. Nor, what, what do you think? Yeah. I think, well, I just want to echo what Imran said. First of all, like we forget sometimes that as a nonprofit and the specific work that we do, it being so draining, so kind of exhausting um, emotionally, we're starting from a different point where, you know, all of this stuff is even more important. It's even more important to have good boundaries and good habits and all of that. So that's something I didn't even think about till just now. But yeah, we're, it's, it's crucial. Um, and then what did I think about what? <laughs> What do you, uh, blah, 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 let me back up here. Just it reimagining the status quo. Oh, yeah. you know, what do you think about kind of this moment in time with COVID and this new frontier of like working from home or doing a hybrid? And yeah. what is one way you think we can reimagine the status quo? Yeah, thank you. No, I think that's, I'm excited to develop this new way of functioning internally. Um, I'm excited about specifically making it more human, like mm -hmm. for all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, I'm excited to, I mean, there's, if we think about it, when's the last time the workplace like changed this much mm -hmm. out of necessity? I can't really think of a time. Um, and so there's so much potential there because we have all of this data of 
you know, that necessity of having to work from home. And we can use that information. We can use our feelings about the last year, take what was good and what worked and mitigate what, you know, sucked or stressed us out or was really harmful and figure out kind of a new balance that isn't just one that's the default of like, you, you come in five days a week, you, you, clock your time not that you know we were ever doing that but Mm -hmm. there there are new ways to think about it um on a personal level you know uh folks function at different times of the day we always (laughs) I think I think as staff members you know we all know when we're at our peak hours and when our brains are going you know my personal peak hour is like or peak hours of productivity as you guys you and I are opposite I know I know I'm like 6 a.m to 9 a.m and in the past that was like half of that was my commute and so I would just be on the bus I would be feeling like my brain's ready to go but I'm just on the bus Um, and it frustrated me to no end. And so I'm really excited for flex time. Um, I'm excited for all of it. I just see so much potential for everybody. Yeah. And I think, you know, the way that we do work in this country and much of the world is like the the work environment was created when men were the, the primary or the sole breadwinners women did all this unpaid labor of everything else, taking care of the kids, managing the home, et cetera. And the office was set up that way. And it was set up for men who had, had either were single or who had wives who took care of everything else. That's not, it hasn't been the case for a long time now in this country. And I, we haven't really evolved. Like we're still functioning in a lot of ways, like it's the 1950s. And I think it seems like just over the past couple of years and especially with COVID, we're seeing that start to finally kind of break up and we're we're really saying, oh, we can let people work from home or we can have on-site child child care or paternity leave is super important for dads, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna make us weaker or less productive. It's actually gonna make us better at our work and more efficient and more sustainable, so. Yeah, exactly. um, Thank you, Noor. Uh, Imran, I think, you know, one of the one of the most surprising things during this time for Care Washington is that we've actually been really successful at growing our team during COVID, and not just growing our team, but recruiting some really top-notch talent uh, to expand the work that we're doing and to expand our reach across Washington State. Can you talk about how we've been able to achieve that during a pandemic, and uh, what you're most excited about with this growing team? Yeah, it's the team that we had, even with me coming into this has has been amazing. Um, You know, I inherited um, some great, great folks already. So props to you all, first and foremost, but then it's just things, things thankfully have have continued to, to line up well for us. So we have, you know, folks like Katie, for example, who's been, you know, while you were out on maternity leave, Katie stepped in and like showed a great skill set. And so we wanted her, you know, we wanted them to stay on um, and be a part of this team for the, for the long haul. You have folks like Aiden who doesn't live in the Seattle bubble. Like she lives in, in Yakima who just came into, into um, the state. And, you know, our goal is to become a truly statewide organization where we're serving these, these communities that are, um outlying from just only the Seattle metro area mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Yakima being in central Washington Spokane Vancouver and so on and so forth um being able to reach out to that and then on a board level like this board is is, is stacked with amazing folks as well we have folks like Nimco who's done amazing work on education and um uh Sumaya who's uh got a legal background and done a great job in terms of like the uh, present pipeline and uh, Yusra, who's, who's a great community member from Federal Way as well. So just to see the energy that's coming into Care Washington's, uh, you know, super exciting. Um, then just the youth, you know, one of the main things from our strategic plan is to continue building a pipeline of folks that are coming into the organization. Uh, Najma has done a great job of creating the Youth Advisory uh, Committee, which is bringing in folks, you know, creating opportunities for internships, exposing them to uh, the work of, of a Care Washington and maybe, you know, helping them chart their career path. So there's tons of these opportunities. And just to see like this community 
who has so many folks that want to get involved in the work that we're doing is really is really amazing. Yeah, I think, you know, what what this has shown us this time is that we used to all, myself included even, used to be kind of cagey, is that the right word? Or like unsure about working from home. Like what is someone really doing when they're working from home? Are they really working? Are they like, you know, and people, maybe you'd work from home one day out of the month or I know we were talking about having one work from home day a week before this all started. And that was like a big deal, you know? And what this has shown is like, not only is it possible, but like it actually can work really, really well. And what that's allowing us to do is recruit even more amazing people because it opens up the opportunities, the, the diversity of like a, a bigger pool of people to choose from because you got someone down in Olympia or someone over in Yakima and they're an awesome candidate, but maybe they don't want to leave Yakima. Maybe that's where their family is. Or maybe you got a young person on, I say the East side, but, um, you know, over east of Lake Washington, <laughs> Bellevue area, Redmond, and they want to work or intern with Care Washington, but maybe they can't get downtown for whatever reasons. Now they can work from home. So I think it's just like really, and now that we see that we can do it so well, and we kind of have this like functioning model that works, it's super exciting because I think it's just going to continue to allow us to have more amazing staff and like do more stuff with the community and it's really exciting. Um, cool. Well, with that, I think we want to answer. Let's see. I lost my place. Yeah. So we had a last week's question of the week. We do a question of the week um, during every episode. And our question last week is that we asked people if they work from home, and if they do work from home, what is their favorite or least favorite part of working from home? So 44% of people that responded said, no, they are not working from home. 56% said, yes, they are. That seems to be pretty in line with national numbers. If I had to guess, I haven't actually looked. Um, and then we got a couple responses about people's favorite part and least favorite part. Um, one person here who answered, he said, my favorite part of working from home is that I can take a little more time for prayer before sunrise, before sunrise. And the most challenging part is trying to sincerely work and care for my daughter at the same time. And I can really relate to that as I have a six month old at home right now. And you guys know some days I'm working and taking care of him. And it's very challenging. It can feel like you're not doing either one as well as you want to, or like, I feel guilty, like I'm neglecting, <laughs> but um, so I can really relate to that comment. And then we have another comment here from um, someone on social media. It says, my favorite part of working from home is being able to eat lunch with my sweetie every day. And the things, the things that I miss most are the edges of the workday, commuting on the light rail, taking the bus, getting coffee from the new cafe, spontaneous activities with coworkers. That makes me emotional. I miss those things. Yeah. <laughs> I do miss those things. The edges, how do they say it? The edges of the day. That's good. It's beautiful. Yeah. So last, we're almost up on our, done with our time here, but uh, I want to ask the both of you, what is your favorite or least favorite part of working from home? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite part is being able to spend more time with my family for sure. Um, but then my least favorite part is not having that, that boundary of space. Um, and I, I miss the commute. I miss going on, getting up in the morning, getting dressed, getting on the bus and going to work. I really miss that. Um, I'll go next. Mine's easy. I'm six months pregnant. So my favorite <laughs> thing is, uh, the proximity of my desk to my fridge and to the restroom and to a couch so I can put my feet up if they're swollen. These are all, you know, especially that last one is something that you maybe wouldn't be able to do at the office without yeah. like feeling unprofessional. <laughs> um, and I mean, on that note, that brings up a whole issue actually for another time maybe of accessibility. You know, folks with chronic pain working from home, um, folks with all sorts of disabilities, it opens up a world um, yeah. to, to yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, I do love working from home. Thank you, Nora. What about you, Imran? Yeah, for me, I mean, you know, I, I coming from a situation where I was doing 
multiple things like an executive director and a business owner and somebody who was traveling frequently for this work and having to respond to every single interview and, and podcast and whatever it may be like you, you don't realize how much of yourself you use up during uh, this process and how much time you're spending away from, you know, your family. Um, and so, I mean, we, back in, maybe it was like 2018, 2019, like that was a visualization exercise we did, I think at a care retreat at one point, they're like, you know, what is, you know, what is the one thing that you really want to sort of get back to? And, you know, when you close your eyes and you really think about like, what are sort of the driving factors in your life? Like your family is, is number one. Um, you, you want to be there for your kids, you know, development and being there to, you know, be, be at their games or whatever it may be. Uh, so being here and being with family, I think is, it's, sometimes a curse, you know, in those little small moments, you know, when there's like that screaming in the background or whatever, but for the most part, it's a blessing, like just spending more time together, you know, going out there and, you know, being able to eat meals together, you know, (laughs) breakfast, lunch and dinner and so on and so forth. So alhamdulillah for, for that, you know, with, I think the great difficulty of this time comes a, a great amount of ease as well. So those are sort of like these moments, if you were just in that traditional environment, you would not be able to get back. So, you know, just definitely cherish those times. Awesome. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, thank you both. This has been a really great conversation on um, working from home and kind of this, this new frontier that we're all navigating. And I think Katie posted Noor's tips for working from home in the comments. We're also gonna share that on our different platforms. So be sure to look out for those. Um, Our next week's episode, we're gonna be joined by a couple of our team members. I think Nejma and Aiden, you Imran, and maybe a couple of our board members, we'll see. And we're gonna be talking about Ramadan traditions. So our question of the week, and we'll post this in the comments, we would love to hear your replies. And if you reply, we'll read your reply during next week's episode. Our question of the week is, what are some Ramadan traditions that you and your family do to make this time of year special? So we would love to hear from you all. Um, Imran and Noor, I really appreciate you both being here. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, it's been a really good conversation. And I will see you on both of you on Zoom. All right. All right. Thanks, guys.